We're going to launch today's program with a presentation by Adrian Lolly Hills. She is a member of the Wyandotte Nation. She's an educator and interpretation specialist living and working in Oklahoma City. She's the associate director of the Studio School at Oklahoma Contemporary. She's received the American Alliance of Museums Excellence in Exhibition Label Writing Award. She served on boards and volunteered with the Association for Art Museum Interpretation, Museum Computer Network, and the Museum Education Roundtable. So please join me in welcoming Adrienne today. Thank you, America. I'm going to share my screen because I do have slides today. Kwe Omaratu, hello friends and good afternoon. My name is Adrian Molly Hills and as America mentioned, I am a citizen of Wyandotte Nation. I am so pleased to be speaking with you today on the topic of label writing and honored to be included among speakers of such amazing knowledge, wisdom and generosity. So before I begin, I thought it'd be helpful to provide a bit of framing for you. I confess I'm a bit of an interloper at this amazing symposium. I'm neither a scholar, writer, nor curator. Instead, over the last 15 years in museums, I worked in learning and interpretation. I consider my core discipline to be education, and as an interpretive planner, my role is to help museum teams create exhibitions that are thematically cogent and engaging for visitors. Yet, as an indigenous person whose personal teaching practice is rooted in liberation, I seek to advance equity and justice through exhibitions, one dang label at a time. This presentation is going to be a pretty wonky nuts and bolts discussion for scholars, writers, and curators, both staff and freelance, working in museum contexts. But as Dr. Atone had mentioned in her keynote, all of these practices I discussed today should conform to and be in service of our deeper Indigenous values. So here's a bit of a spoiler alert. If you're looking for a quick fix, these are my top five recommendations for writing better labels. They're not particularly groundbreaking, and I know a lot of you are familiar with and already implement these recommendations. However, it's essential to understand that good labels do not exist in a vacuum. They are the extension of intentional work you perform well before the writing has even begun. It's certainly a tip of the iceberg scenario. Good labels are the result of the implementation of best inter interpretive practices, recursive work among colleagues and community, as well as an understanding of and sensitivity to visitor behavior, all while working within that milieu of equity and decolonization. So today we're going to cover a lot of these considerations and we'll return to this graphic one more time. So first let's talk about what goes into an interpretive plan. An interpretive plan is composed of the elements listed here. It's an internal document that frames out the planning, planning process for exhibitions. An early version of your interpretive plan should be drafted even before you start thinking concretely about your checklist of objects. That is, if you're organizing a new exhibition. Over time, your interpretive plan can and should evolve to reflect the thinking of your team as it changes over time. Now, you can find a ton of examples of interpretive plans online. I've grifted a lot of stuff from colleagues. <laughs> And I recommend looking at um, folks' planning documents and comparing them with your own preferences and processes. You gotta figure out what works for you. Now, the first element of an interpretive plan is the big idea, which is a short statement that lays out the conceptual groundwork for your exhibition. And here, you will find some helpful steps in authoring that big idea. Throughout this presentation, you may notice that I return to the theme of working together, and this is intentional. Good exhibitions and excellent labels are not the product of a single author. Each step requires that you work in tandem with colleagues as well as community so that the project benefits from many perspectives and areas of expertise. The big idea is not an exhibition description. You don't need to include highlights from the checklist or herald how important or unprecedented the exhibition is. Instead, state as succinctly as you can what you are saying about this work on view. Consider it the thesis of the exhibition and don't worry too much at this point about making it written in an accessible manner for your audience. This is just an internal document that's gonna guide your thinking. Once you've arrived at the big idea, make sure that it's shared widely throughout your organization so that it's reinforced in all visitor facing content, including website content, press releases, and development pitches to funders. These types of anticipatory texts can shape the entrance narrative, which Dr. Milo uh, mentioned yesterday, of your visitors, which we'll talk about more in detail later in this presentation. 
So here's an example of a big idea from a reinstallation of Japanese art I worked on while with the Nils and Ericus. And it's pretty typical of a more traditional survey style presentation of permanent collection objects. And honestly, our team probably could have winnowed this down um, and made it maybe a little bit more provocative. Ooh. Um, but hindsight is 2020. And here is a big idea from my former colleague, Melissa Mayer. Together with her team, she wrote this big idea for a thematic exhibition of decorative arts objects at the Carnegie Art Museum. You'll notice it doesn't even reference the specific objects that were on view or, or in this installation. Instead, it speaks to some more conceptual ideas and themes. Next, you may begin to write your key messages, and this is where you're really going to have to exercise restraint. Together with your team, you'll need to judiciously determine the highest level concepts that you want your visitors to walk away from your exhibition with. Now, will writing key messages ahead of time limit the scope of more granular content you can include in your interpretive text? Heck no. But they serve an important role in ensuring clarity and thematic coherence among all of your many, many interpretive elements. Uh, you can tell innumerable stories about almost any topic and any object. The big idea and key messages just assist you in determining which of those stories are most salient to this specific exhibition at hand. Here are some key messages from the Japanese art reinstallation I mentioned earlier. And you'll note that they're not necessarily written with visitors in mind. They're a little long and assume some prior knowledge. Yet, they were essential in pl our planning process. Later through development, our team integrated these concepts in more plain language throughout all of our interpretive text and digital interactives. And here you will find the key messages for the thematic exhibition at the Carnegie. You'll note that these don't even cite the type of objects or what period they're from. Instead, the focus here is on those broader, more global concepts that can be applied to almost any collection of any type of object in any museum. I really like this type of key message, which is known in the education world as an enduring understanding, a bit of conceptual knowledge that can be broadly applied to many different disciplines. This is basically our version of teaching our visitors how to fish. And following Dr. Autan's keynote presentation yesterday, I'm led to think about what indigenous values and enduring understandings I can surface and highlight in my own interpretive work moving forward. For the purposes of today's presentation, I'm not going to go into visitor outcomes, but they're essential if you plan to include interactive interpretive elements such as video, hands-on making stations, or response areas. You can find a ton of literature on this um, online on the Visitor Studies Association's website, runinformalscience.org, a free repository of visitor studies papers largely applicable to all museums, not just science centers. So when we look to the literature, what do we know about the people who come to our exhibitions? First up, from a cognitive and social perspective, museum visits are wild. Throughout their visit, our visitors are orienting themselves in what's usually a poorly laid out building. They're juggling the concerns of their partner, friend, or children, and they're managing their own time. And all of this is happening as fatigue is setting in and they're encountering lots of new information and stimuli. Yet despite all these odds, not to mention the cost of admission and the hassle of getting there, visitors still come to look at art and we really should be applauding them. So I recommend that you acquire a lens of empathy as you begin to frame your interpretive plan and write your labels. Understand that our visitors are operating in an economy of attention. To this end, it's vital that label writers understand the concept of perceived cost benefit our visitors will consciously and unconsciously consider, is this label too long? Is this new information to me? Is it gonna help me understand what I'm looking at or answer questions I have? Your label really does have to prove its worth at first glance. And three, so despite what this GIF suggests, we don't inf receive information as passive vessels. Instead, we actively and iteratively construct it through experience. In the same way, our visitors are arriving at your exhibition with some prior knowledge of and definitely misconceptions about the topic you were addressing. Sometimes we call a visitor's previously held thoughts, feelings, and experiences with the topic the entrance narrative. Now, as Dr. Maifo mentioned yesterday, prior knowledge and entrance narratives are extremely durable, but they can be malleable over time. It's definitely playing the long game. 
Through visitor research and front-end evaluation, you can roughly approximate what sorts of entrance narratives your visitors might bring to an exhibition. And this is huge. It allows you to align your interpretive plan accordingly and use the label real estate that you do have in a more efficient and effective manner. Front-end evaluation can also underscore what harmful assumptions the public holds that you do need to chip away at. Entrance narratives can also be influenced by the messages constructed by your own institution or by the media. So it's important to ensure that your marketing and communications colleagues are aware of, if not active participants in, any front-end research as well as your interpretive plan. Keep in mind that these anticipatory messages aren't just limited to text, but image selection as well. Now let's get to the meat of this presentation, the actual writing. Regardless of your area of expertise or depth of experience in the field, it's essential to find a good writing partner. If you work in an institution, you can find a peer in your curatorial education or communications departments, even if those folks are departments or one or themselves wear multiple hats. If you work freelance, make sure that there's room in your budget and timeline for someone who can provide interpretive edits for clarity and accessibility, as well as a copy editor to bring the whole thing together. Sometimes if you're lucky, you can find someone to do both. And if you find them, tell me, please. Once you've identified your working partner, plan for process. How many rounds of edits will you have? Which other stakeholders need to see the text before it's on the wall? At what point does the copy editor review the ratified tasks, text? Answering these questions and writing them down before you begin saves a lot of heartache. Three, before you begin your first draft, work with your interpretive partner to establish intended content for introductory text, section panels, and extended labels. You're gonna to wanna to ask yourself, what key messages are you addressing here? How does each panel or label link back to the big idea? And you can sketch this out on paper, in Word, or even use a spreadsheet. Just make sure that you work it out in advance on paper or written down. And four, Please share your terrible first drafts with your peers. I actually prefer it when my curatorial colleagues provide rough text or even bullet points to facilitate a quicker and more effective writing process. It catches issues earlier and also helps reinforce that prose belongs to the whole team, not just a single author. Now, sometimes curators get the enviable opportunity to produce an exhibition based off their original research or writing. This can be both a blessing and a curse. Remember that your exhibition is more than just a single authorial enterprise. It is a chance for visitors to see new works of art, explore new ideas, and learn more about not just the topic addressed, but themselves and their world. So to underscore, the exhibition is not your dissertation, article, or catalog. Exhibitions are aesthetic, literary, temporal, political, and social creatures. You need to give the exhibition the freedom it needs from your original text. Let the exhibition be its own bad self. Now, as you begin to write, here are some tips. Make sure that you already have your interpretive plan open on your desktop and top of mind. As a content specialist, you have both the benefit and burden of a lot of knowledge available to you at automatic recall. So again, the task here is to thoughtfully apply your expertise to the story you're telling in this exhibition as defined by the interpretive plan. Two, a lot of curatorial colleagues of mine begin the task of writing with the extended object labels, and I don't blame them. They're really fun to write, and many of us are in this line of work because we want to look at gorgeous objects. However, I actually recommend writing your section text first, particularly if you're working on a thematic, not necessarily chronological or geographic installation. I found that starting here helps the writer keep the big idea and key messages more consistently represented in the many, many, many object label labels you'll have to author later. And three, speaking of object label labels, as you write these, it's important to position yourself in the shoes of the visitor. Remember the perceptions of cost benefit? They're looking at that object and likely glancing at the label for assistance or to deepen their visual investigation of the work on view. Now is your time to ground them. You gotta be pithy and start with that object. Don't start with artist biographical details or the stylistic school the artist originates from, but this object right here. 
So this is probably the most controversial slide in my presentation. Every time I meet a new curatorial friend or join a new institution, I reliably get that look and that inevitable question, hey, so what's my word limit? And the truth is, is that the literature doesn't provide us with a single number that does the trick. Instead, it's incumbent on all of us to consider a lot of factors, including the size and scope of installation, the subject matter addressed in the exhibition, how much text you want to present overall, the nature of the works on view, visitor prior knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. For that reason, my experiences have led me to conclude that the above, that the Numbers here strike the careful balance between sensitivity to visitor behavior, as well as reasonable expectations for what we can write. Could you always write less? Heck yeah. Now again, writing exhibition texts cannot be done in a vacuum. And occasionally you may yourself be conscripted into providing interpretive edits to a colleague. And this is an excellent way to sharpen your own label writing practice. Interpretive edits are distinct from those you would receive from a copy editor. They're often more conceptual in nature and can require a good deal of revision. Hence my recommendation to send earlier drafts rather than laboring over a polished gem that just isn't gonna work. Here are a couple things you'll wanna consider as you review text from an interpretive perspective. One, keep it short and simple. A second pair of eyes can always trim the fat. I actually recommend using the Hemingway app, which is a great way to visualize and eliminate bad writing habits. Two, when you're referencing work elsewhere in the exhibition or just important other works, go ahead and use uh, a thumbnail image on the label. Great thing is, is that you can absolutely claim fair use on that. Three, I can't tell you how many times I've let, read a, level, a label that seems to only be a recitation of the artist's CV. Now, I don't really care if that artist went to RISD and I'm not sure that our visitors do either. This is generally not helpful to the typical visitor and uses a valuable space that could be dedicated to supporting their one moment with that specific work of art. Artists can handle their own PR. Four, don't name drop without explanation. I found that sometimes when I'm in scholar mode, I forget to introduce new people. Now this is rude at parties and it's rude in labels. Make sure that you quickly note who someone or something is. And five, make sure that your label actually begins with the object on view. This can run counter to the way that we're asked to construct an argument in an essay. A rule of thumb I like to use is to write like an image caption in a magazine. For example, take a look at this picture on the slide and imagine it's included in a story on climate change. A caption may read, clad with ropes and tools, this man makes his way into a perilous crevasse. Activities such as ice climbing may become less frequent as climate change alters the landscape of the Arctic. In this way, you begin with the specific and concrete and visual, and you lead then into broader ideas for concepts. Now, here are some basic design principles that we all know in our heart of hearts, but can't quite always see through to the end of an install. I know as aesthetic creatures, sometimes it hurts us to see a high contrast, large print label on a dark wall in a dim room but we really do have to put accessibility first. Not only is it the right thing to do, in the United States, it's the law. All right, now we're gonna talk about the good stuff, equity and decolonization in label writing. Remember this diagram? Our really good labels, iceberg, is floating around in the Malo of equity and decolonization practice. Here, I argue that all of these practices should be done in the name of liberation, not necessarily a good visitor experience, which seems to be kind of the general vague goal in our world of art museums. Instead, like many of you, I'm interested in presenting art experiences that are also dismantling and challenging the harmful narratives about indigenous and other minoritized people the museums have and still do actively reinforce. We do have words for art and those words are powerful. Many of the other speakers in this symposium will address decolonization practice and scholarship in dis public discourse. And all of those considerations should be taken in mind when producing exhibition text. My remaining thoughts here are gonna be limited to the actual label on hand. Here are some simple steps to plan for and write labels in the name of equity. One, complete, include your community in all stages of your planning and writing processes. It is from them that we draw credibility and relevance. 
Two, the past and present are complex and composed of many perspectives. Before you begin to draft your text, consider the fact that your voice often as an institution strikes the viewer as neutral and authoritative, particularly if you're in an encyclopedic art museum or natural history setting. In this society, that means a white voice. Help democratize your text by inviting in new voices and perspectives that have historically not been included in the dominant narratives. And I'm not just talking academic ones. Make sure too that you credit those voices when you include them. And three, consider that your budget is a moral document. Plan to pay community members and knowledge keepers for their work and expertise. Remember that equity and decolonization should impact all areas of our practice. We should routinely audit and update our institutional practice. Does your organization still use problematic or outdated terminology and tombstone labels? Do you have some hella problematic labels from the 1990s hanging out in the dusty old gallery 326? These may not be top of your to-do list, but your visitors are reading those labels and that outdated, incorrect or offensive content does do active harm. Um, Similarly, good interpretation cannot resolve colonialist collecting and organization practices. If you have the energy and the capital, I encourage you to consider everything open for litigation and rethink the subtle ways in which museums reinforce, reinforce colonizers' thinking. And lastly, as you look to the future, find new ways to implement the practices we discussed and will discuss later today with a sense of urgency. Again, if you have the energy to do so. Exhibitions can be impactful and over time do shape public discourse about the past, present, and future of Indigenous people. The steps of interpretive planning can feel cumbersome at first, but when operationalized, become powerful and essential tools to our practice and our goals. Now, if this all felt like drinking from a fire hose, I understand. So you can just keep the words of Mr. Tilden in mind. How can we use our exhibitions to provoke our audiences to understanding? to appreciation, to action, to reconciliation, and to justice. Season A, and thank you. And please feel free to reach out to me with any questions, or I think we might have time for q and uh, Adrian, I'd like to start um, with a question about editing. Um, for some of our early career folks or students who may be watching, um, getting used to the editorial process, both in terms of interpretation and copy editing, um, can be a bit daunting and scary. Uh, but something that uh, Nancy Myflo mentioned in her comments yesterday was that um, editing is a form of love. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you view that? I love that phrase, and I, I think it's something that we should return to. Um, you know, entering, yeah, an editing or an editing relationship between, you know, an editor and an author can sometimes feel like a relationship. It's one that's predicated on trust and knowing this person outside this just single act of writing a label. Now, that's really hard to do um, in a larger institution, um, but if you're working in a smaller space, it might come more easily. So I do recommend that um, you know you do get to know from a personal le level, both the, the author and editor should connect. Um, I think that that does alleviate some anxiety and it allows opportunities for those recursive conversations that need to happen um, just because you will be revisiting the text many, many times. So we have a question from uh, Robin Grossbeck. Adrian, can you please speak a little more, um, starting with the section texts and how you begin extended labels um, while also prioritizing the content available? Yeah, so I have just found that writing section texts first is really great because it almost kind of is like a stake in your big tent. You know, those are really larger conceptual moments in the framing out of your exhibition. And so I do find that folks struggle a little bit more if they start with the object label rather than those larger conceptual texts. So that's just a little, pro, again, pro tip I've found um, uh, in starting that writing process. It is also super helpful because that text can be repurposed for gallery guide training, for um, maybe a pricey of the exhibition, for internal um, information sharing. That, that type of text is actually really, really um, 
constructive um, and helpful for people outside the exhibition team. Yeah, I think the um, one thing that I often do is save the things that didn't make it that, you know, are cut from the label for education staff and uh, docent training and other things. I'm like, it's, it's not, we don't need it in the label, but it's helpful to know. And so you're yeah. not actually getting rid of it. You're just moving it to another space where it can be used um, in different interactions. You're totally right. And you, you definitely need to think about tours and um, other kinds of educational elements. It's part of your interpretive endeavor. Um, so really you do want to, you don't want to permanently delete anything, just understand it might live elsewhere in the constellation of the broader interpretive um, thrust of that exhibition. Thank you, Adrienne, again, for this lovely presentation. Uh, there's actually a question from Stacy Pratt. Uh, I'm working with Stacy on an exhibition text. Um, I, I don't know that I, um, I kind of am a creature of art museums where the inroads to writing for exhibitions is a little bit more um, hierarchical and um, predefined. You know, it's typically um, curators, the author text, but I think that um, the more and more galleries and more community-led presentations of art are becoming interested in interpretation. And so I think that you can find opportunities in contemporary art spaces to think about labels in a more data-driven best practices manner, rather than just slapping a tombstone next to a work of art. Um, so I know that I've had uh, Stacy write for me actually at a contemporary art center, and I would encourage folks to look to those spaces, which are more open to people maybe coming from creative writing fields or people who are coming from adjacent fields of scholarship or themselves are independent scholars. Again, like within the art museum world, those um, those kind of through lines into the institution are a little bit more ossified and require a pedigree sort oftentimes. Yeah, yeah, and I really appreciated your comments about um, incorporating a multiplicity of voices and perspectives. So we have two questions that I'm going to combine because they're related. Um, one from uh, Stace Treat and one from Angela Wild. So, the first is, what do you think, or what do you feel are some common mistakes museums make in interpreting indigenous art? And the second is, the word object can be offensive. Can you speak about acceptable words to use instead of object? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I frankly, just as a practitioner, use object um, for everything from a Van Gogh to a ceramic vase to anything. So that's probably a great thing for me to consider as I. I speak to colleagues, um, you know, the, I don't often see objects in visitor facing text. So um, I would often just see a work of art, um, a decorative, you know, um, I think I would, I would tend to just be more specific and cite what it is. Um, so that's, that's a really great question. Um, what was the second question from Stace? I'm sorry. The, it was, um, what are some, um, hold on, let me pull it up here. Um, what do you feel are some common mistakes museums make in interpreting indigenous art? Um, I've seen a variety of different mistakes, definitely uh, institutions that are positioning, I'm gonna say objects again, but no, now I'm checking myself. I really love that that person raised that question. Um, uh, people will position, on, works of art just from an ethnographic perspective, um, even in a, a context in which it's appropriate, say a fine arts museum, um, or people completely divorce it from um, its context and it becomes purely an aesthetic element that's kind of evaluated and appreciated on the Western terms. Um, so those, those would be two kind of opposing but extreme <laughs> uh, points of departure that I see some institutions take um, when starting to write objects. There are definitely a lot, uh, or starting to write objects labels. Um, 
there are definitely a lot of like more specific pitfalls that I think are in, in of themselves understandable, but more representative of an institution that's not working in consult consultation with community. There are indigenous people everywhere. So particularly if you're operating in the Midwest like me, you have no excuse but to have be in relationship um, with people from whom those works of art originate. 